So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Fashion Summit 2023. I'm really honored uh, to be here today as a moderator. So I have three great speakers here on the panel with me. So I hope that we can deliver a really fascinating um, you know, moments for in the next 45 minutes for us to enjoy uh, our dialogue on stage. So thank you so much for attending the event. So may I just in, uh, introduce a little bit about our speaker. So I have three prestigious high-level executive um, you know, who has been working in this industry for a long time. So they have all the experience um, in driving strategic goals and priorities for, you know, for really, um, you know, some of the leaders, I would say, in the industry. So I'm really fortunate to be, you know, sitting with three of them on stage on this moment. I really want to enjoy this moment with them. So may I uh, introduce um, Dr. Dalman Lee, Vice Chair of Toll Apparel Limited. Dr. Lee is currently the Vice Chair of Toll Apparel Limited. He leads Toll Apparel on its long-term strategy and continuous innovations in various aspects of the business. Major focus on digital transformation, disruptive technologies, business model innovations, and sustainability. Is responsible for the innovation, innovative services of Toll, such as vendor managed inventory and lease the sustainability journey of Toll in the past 15 plus years. Dr. Lee processes extensive experience in, in information technology and management in global operations. He also has a strong background in research. So, may I invite the second speaker, um, Mr. Andrew Lowe? CEO of Crystal International Group Limited. Andrew Lowe is currently the Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of Crystal International Group Limited. He graduated from the University of Toronto with a bachelor degree in arts, majoring in economics. Crystal International Group Limited, um, established in 1970s by Andrew's parents, who is sitting, I think, in front of us. Is a leading garment manufacturer with global presence in Vietnam, China, Bangladesh, Cambodia, and Sri Lanka. It employs over 70,000 people globally with an annual turnover of US 2.4 billion in 2022. It produces over 400 million pieces of garments of five main product categories, including lifestyle wear, sports wear, denim, intimate, and sweater. Last but not least, I would like to invite my third honorable uh, speaker, Theresa Young, Vice Chairman of Esquire Group. So Theresa has been the chairman, Vice Chairman of Esquire Group since 2025. 20, Esquire is a leading global knowledge-based innovation company, driven by its vision of making a difference which focuses on two primary goals, tackling climate change and narrow, narrowing the wealth gap. Theresa is also responsible for Esquire Group's strategic planning, served as chairman of the Hong Kong Research Institute of Textile and Apparel, Hong Kong Ritter. She actively participates in the development of Hong Kong's textile and clothing industry, in her current capacity at the Hong Kong Poly Polytechnic University's Industrial Advisory Committee of the Research Institute for Intelligent Wearable System, as well as its advisory committees for school fashion and textiles. She is a member of the clothing industry training authority. Among the nonprofit making organization services, She's involved in YL Foundation and Young Presidents Organization Hong Kong Chapters. She's also selected as a North Asia Regional Honoree for the 2020 YPO Global Impact Award. She holds an MBA from the Chinese University of Hong Kong and Bachelor of Business Administration degree from the University of Hawaii. So without further ado, I would like to um, talk a little bit about in the next few minutes about the objective 
of this session. I'm sure that um, everybody is aware the session is more about beyond the target. So um, for those of you who are very familiar and working with climate change, you will see more and more companies around the globe are making bold commitments to combat climate change. And there's a recent report by the Science-Based Target Initiative, which report the highest number of targets on record along in 2022. To give you some figures, in 2021 alone, 1,082 science-based target was approved by SPTI, which is Science-Based Target Initiative. And 1,171 companies are committed to set science-based target. So if you count your numbers in total, that would include about 2,000 plus companies are committing to set targets and drive actions to tackle climate change. If we look back into five years ago, we only have 109 companies approved SBTs, 106 companies committed to set SBT. So you will see there's a, you know, there's a huge difference compared to where we are five years ago. And just to give you the total, so we have around 6,000 companies currently taking actions on climate change, which, which are committed to set science-based target and approved by SBTI. So just to give you a background in terms of scale. Um, and then um, another research piece before we tap into the climate action. So according to research, um, if you are approved by the SBT, you have to be aligned with your climate action. That means your reduction has to be at least 4.2% reduction of emission per year. But from research, if companies are having approved science-based target, they tend to go faster. So uh, we've seen that there is a linear rate of 8.8%, scope one and two reduction um, a year per during the period as with the approved target. So definitely the science, setting science-based target is you know, resulting in faster, driving faster climate action. So, the gift, so with the, a lot of experience and, and with the speakers, um, I would like to open up a little bit about to understand about in order to achieve the science-based target or commitment, um, you know, by the date, um, companies will need to evaluate a few things in terms of resources. Financially, human resources and expertise, organization, structure, uh, regulatory requirements, and how to secure full organization support to actually prioritize the decarbonization priorities in order to achieve just an equitable, low carbon transition. So without further ado, let me turn to my left hand side. Uh, so Delman, uh, Dr. Lee, so can you tell me a little bit about, you know, about your key pillars? Um, I know that, you know, three of you, your companies already committed to a long-term net zero goal by 2050. So Delman, can you tell us a little bit more about the key pillars of uh, TOR's climate action program? Thank you, Joyce. Yeah, thanks, Delman. Hopefully it'll be an interesting conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, the, just a bit of background, so um, when we started on the sustainability journey, the pillars of environmental and the strategy was relatively simple at that time, maybe too naive. Um, so there was, at that time, it was what, what we can do within our own four walls, own operations, and what's outside the four walls. That was roughly it. That was 10 years ago. Um, but with the recent urgency in, in uh, climate change, and then the science tells us that we need to reach certain numbers by 2030, which is less than 10 years time, and net zero by 2050, everyone's, it's sort of, um, have been on the journey for a while, still it needs to do a lot. And so our current strategy actually now has, has four pillars, you could say. Um, sustainable operations, which is still things within our own control, uh, within our own facility. Uh, sustainable supply chain, this is when we start reaching out to our supply chain partners, uh, in particular upstream partners, where as you know, um, you may have heard from Jeremy earlier on that one of the hotspots is in the fabric mills, 
Um, so that one is supply chain, uh, sustainable supply chain. Um, sustainable supply chain also has another angle um, because one of the solutions to co combating climate change is circularity. So supply chain is a major part of it if you want to do it um, as well. The third one is sustainable products. So whatever we make and sell should be sustainable. So that includes material, how you design the products, uh, uh, et cetera. And then the last one, we thought about merging it into the other pillars, but we specifically call it out, is sustainable customers. So this is the bit that tried to address the fact that um, we ourselves want to do it is not enough. We actually need to look for like-minded, sustainable brands and retailers um, for this to work. So these are sort of the, four, the four pillars that we have. Oh, that's really great. So you have four very distinguished pillar, which looks after different, you know, areas. So let me turn to Andrew a little bit. Um, so Andrew, what's the, you know, what is Crystal's current key pillars of your climate action program? Can you tell us a little bit more? Okay, sure. Uh, I think for our whole sustainability uh, program, I think our focus is in uh, three areas, uh, being, you know, carbon, you know, water, and waste. So on the carbon part, like you mentioned earlier, uh, we have committed to carbon net zero by 2050 and a uh, absolute reduction of 35% by 2030. But actually our challenge is more than that 35%. Uh, because 35% is absolute reduction, any of our growth in capacity uh, needs to be 100% reduced. So after calculation, our, uh, we need to reduce our uh, our carbon emission by 70%, you know, uh, by 2030. So, so 30% is, 35% uh, is much easier, 70% is much tougher. So what are we doing about this? Um, the way we are tackling this is uh, we have committed to put solar panels onto all of our factory roofs. Uh, we calculated around 20%. Uh, it can help to reduce our energy usage by around 20%. Uh, and then we also employed an energy consultant to go through all of our factories to look at energy saving initiatives. That is another around 10% savings there. So, so these are solid savings that we can calculate. Uh, and uh, the third part of, of the savings comes from productivity. So the, the more we look into our operations, actually what we found is there are a lot of waste, uh, uh, actually uh, waste that we cannot see is, you know, is idle time waste, you know, a lot of productivity waste. So uh, we, we reckon that we can save at least another 20%, you know, uh, improve 20% productivity, which will help us to reduce our energy intense, uh, the, the, the carbon uh, intensity by around 20%. So, so these three initiatives will help us uh, on the carbon side, you know. So even with, with these three, it will not cover the 70% that we need to do. So we don't have all the answers yet, you know. Uh, we, we are still exploring all, uh, the rest of the answers uh, to get us to our climate goals. Uh, although we still have, you know, six more years to go, you know, uh, seven more years to go, so hopefully we'll find all the answers by then. Uh, uh, the second part is water. You know, so water is kind of understated in the recent, you know, uh, uh, in the recent, you know, uh, uh, discussions, you know. Uh, but fresh water is getting scarce. Uh, it's not enough fresh water for, for, for the world. Uh, so I think, you know, we, are fo we have focused a lot of energy in reducing the, the water that we use. So in our last five-year plan uh, that has been completed in 2022, we have already uh, saved another, we have saved around 33% uh, uh, of water, you know, uh, of fresh water usage through, you know, recycling water and also by changing to more energy efficient, you know, uh, washing machines, uh, dyeing machines, et cetera, you know. And uh, because we are only, you know, partway through the whole program, so we see that, you know, we will have further savings in the coming five years. And the uh, last uh, part uh, is waste, you know. So we have committed to zero production waste to landfill. So hopefully these three can help the world, you know, to improve the environment. Very comprehensive uh, strategy as well. So let me turn to Teresa. So Teresa, can you tell us a little bit about Asquel's perspective and how, what, the, what are the key pillars in your climate action program? Okay, thank you, Joyce. I think the first two um, speakers have really covered a lot. 
Um, but I'm happy to share also what Escal is doing. Um, for Escal, you know, under our vision of making a difference, we um, specifically focus on climate change as well as wealth gap. And for today, I guess we are more focused on the climate action program. So I'll just share uh, what we're really doing on the climate action side. Um, I think for us, because we're vertically integrated, and so we have started a journey about 20 years ago, and it has not been an easy journey. Um, but I think right now, we would really like to focus on the following key areas. Um, first one, of quite obvious, is optimizing energy efficiency. Um, I think the first two speakers have also pointed out, you know, we can do a lot to help uh, reduce waste. And especially during our production process, there's so much we can do in re-engineering the process. Um, and so that's for sure our number one. Number two is to drive responsible material consumption. Um, again, you know, because we're vertically integrated. So in between each process, um, we can also do quite a bit in the product design, starting from the product design, and then all the way to the production workshops, um, as well as educating our operators. So for one example, just by reducing the rework percentage has already helped us to address both number one and number two. And then the third one, I would say, is prioritize clean energy. So in the past few years, we've been really working a lot on um, adopting solar panels and so using solar energy as much as we can. And luckily, I think that technology is getting more mature. And so it is also um, commercially, I think, more viable today. Uh, the next one I would say is grow our green value chains. I think uh, Delman addressed like um, uh, how to get the customers to work with us. I mean, starting from the very beginning of our supply chain, working with our suppliers, then with our customers, um, all the other stakeholders, including our banks, or even partners who are not in our industry. Uh, just by sharing ideas. A lot of times I learn a lot from the other industries on how they are also um, working to help um, building this whole climate action program. And um, maybe the next one is um, also our, oh sorry, one more point, growing our green value chain. Uh, for us, um, we have been investing a lot in the development of new technology. So in our value chain, we have also been trying to do some more transformational um, initiatives. For example, uh, we have been trying to adopt natural dye so that it can eventually maybe at least replace some of the chemical dyes. And then also um, we have used 10 years to do a research on um, doing waterless dyeing for cotton material. So hopefully we don't even have to use water. And of course, the, uh, a very interesting point that I like to highlight here is really something that may not be so obvious, but we have been promoting a green lifestyle within our own community. So we're not only focusing on the production process, but we're also focusing on the daily lifestyle of every member within Escal. And hopefully we can also transform the not only habit, but also mindset. So for example, in our dining um, hall, we have been using a different model, which can actually help us to reduce food waste. And also, um, a lot of times, they can also enjoy the local produce. So thank you. Yes, that's a great one. Thank you, um, Teresa. I see a lot of uh, solutions, technologies, um, a lot of common themes in not, you know, working not only in your own sphere of influence, your own operation, but you also extend your reach, right? So you work with your customers, you work with your suppliers up the supply chain. So I see a lot of innovations and solutions and common areas to drive, you know, 
materials innovation, um, process change, um, even you know, upgrading your wastewater treatment plant and also upscaling renewable energy. So referring back to you know, Jeremy's um, keynote speech this morning, uh, he also emphasized on a report that was done a few years ago by WRI, where we identified seven uh, key interventions that would be able to drive climate change, including some of the interventions that you know, the speakers were emphasizing, maximizing en energy efficiency right so everybody can can maximize their energy efficiency energy conservation upscaling renewables um, and looking into materials innovations and other you know innovations etc and and Andrew also kindly mentioned that maybe we don't have all the answers yet but we are in it together so I would like to move into this next question so since you guys are you know um, sort of heading the company in terms of in terms of priorities and strategies, right? So how do you incentivize um, your employees and your workers and your staff in all levels uh, and seeing that climate change is a personal thing, like they have to contribute? I think Teresa touched on it a little bit about encouraging sustainable lifestyle. Maybe I can start, start with Andrew, if, you, if I may. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, I think uh, for us, um, the journey is easier because we started our journey over 15 years ago in 2007. Uh, so at that time, um, the word sustainability was not popular. You know, we were still talking about, talk about green, you know, uh, how to be greener, you know, etc. So uh, at that time, I still remember my, my dad, Mr. Lowe. Uh, 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 the chairman, uh, so he he was uh, he he really wants to do good to the planet, you know. Uh, so he 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 will, he was pushing you know us to uh, to be more green, you know, to be more energy efficient, etc. But I'm more from a practical side, you know. So I was challenging about you know about you know if green means expenses, then it means that uh, expenses means less competitive, less profit, less productivity. It does not work, right? So, uh, so at that time we argued a lot, uh, and at the end, what we found is we found another word in terms of not expenses, investment. So, uh, so initial, so if it's an investment, investment means there's a return on the money that we put in. Mm -hmm. Expenses, you, you know, it's gone. You know, money you put in is gone. So if it is, if it is an investment, it will align with business goals. So, uh, so I was a little bit skeptical in the beginning, you know, about you know how how much, uh, you know, about the investment return part. Uh, so the initial projects we did, uh, actually the returns were f f were just phenomenal. Uh, they were more like twenty five percent return, thirty percent return. So, or uh, I think some of it is two and a half years return. So really, really fast return projects. Uh, so that, I, I think with those type of projects, it gave us a lot of confidence about investing in, uh, in uh, uh, green technologies at that time, you know. And later on, the word sustainability comes out, uh, talking about people, planet, profit, uh, which means that a company investing in, uh, in uh, sustainable uh, 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 energy, etc., needs to have a uh, needs to have a return on it. You know, mm -hmm. so 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 what? So I think basically that helps us to align uh, to align the sustainability goals with our business goals. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now, actually, I don't really have much uh, pressure on to the team to be sustainable, because for them, being sustainable is actually uh, being good to business. Mm -hmm. You know. So right now, let's say uh, solar, which is a, a, a very big investment for us in the next few years. Uh, uh, actually, solar right now, the return is around seven years. So seven years, which means around 15% return. Some of our sites is uh, with high energy prices, it can be more like five years, a 20% return. So, so a 15 to 20% return is better than a lot of projects that we're investing in. in, in uh, uh, in the company, so so I think uh, uh, so. Actually, we don't really need too much uh, too much you know push to the to the uh, to the uh, uh, factory management to adopt you know uh, uh, best practice in in sustainability. But what we really did is uh, we 
formed a very strong, you know, corporate sustainability team. Uh, because our, yes, our, our, uh, there's no pressure for our team, uh, there, there's no pressure uh, needed to push our team to adopt, you know, sustainable strategies. But the problem is for them, uh, their, 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 their objectives, their main goals are not really to drive sustainability. The main goals is drive, you know, uh, on time delivery, uh, quick, quick turn time, you know, uh, fast fashion. Uh, so, so they, 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 their, their goals are a bit different. You know, they're lower cost. Uh, so our corporate sustainability team, the good thing is, uh, they can do all the research. They can do all the, uh, they can do all the uh, strategies, do all the alignment, and do all the monitoring. Uh, so, uh, so it's like a one-stop solution on sustainability uh, uh, to our to our uh, to our factory managers to adopt. So, so that has helped us quite a lot. So, so basically, the adoption in our sustainability strategies is uh, actually quite effortless. Great. Thank you for the great insights and 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 you know um, you talk about gaining confidence and and business case right so you don't need to push from the top anymore and and you will need you know you you build a really strong sustainability team as well to support uh, the company goals and how your you know sustainability goals is aligning with your business uh, goals so that that's a great point. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, thanks. Let me turn to uh, Delman, uh, Dr. Lee. So, um, can you give us a little bit tips about uh, you know how you, as a senior leader, how do you incentivize your um, you know your staff to drive maybe accelerate climate action? Yeah, Andrew's story. I have similar experience. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we also sort of started at the top, mm. um, in particular the, the management team that have some doubt whether sustainability is, is it really here, are we too early, are we too, too advanced of others? Um, there's always, even today, there's a constant question of um, is doing good really good for business? Um, but we started at the top, we showed them signs of um, how the, the world needs it, the science needs it, and then of course more recently everybody can see the regulations are coming. Mm. Um, so to, to even remain in business and let alone to be competitive, you, you have to start to work on sustainability. So we started at the top, convincing the top, and then actually in all the our three year plans or annual plan, the sustainability has targets in, the, in there as well. And then like uh, every annual dinner, we will have uh, awards for the most sustainable factory in terms of improvements that they make either in climate change or, or in water. Um, and I'm not exactly where Andrew is. Um, I think sustainability is more or less embedded, not everywhere yet. Um, the sustainability in our organization is small, it's only like four people. Um, but to do all the thing, right, the four pillars I mentioned, sustainable operations, sustainable supply chain, sustainable products and sustainable customers, how can four people run it? So of course they can't, so it has to be embedded in, in every department's uh, uh, work. Um, so that's it, to a certain extent, uh, 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 embedded. But I'd just like to finish off with, we did an engagement survey, an employee engagement survey some years ago, and the usual suspect comes up, right? So the top thing that employee would lo like, love to have is um, career development. Uh, pay, pay is somewhere up at the top five, <laughs> top three, I'm sure. Um, but surprisingly, the third engagement factor was actually the sustainability the journey that the company is on. So, so when I saw that, I was so happy, very happy that the fact that all these things we put in, annual plan, three-year plan, but actually you find that uh, employees are actually engaged by, by your purpose that, that the company is going through. So that's, that's yeah, that's, that's my journey so far. Thanks, Delman, for uh, sharing your journey. So just for, you know, the last speaker. Um, so, Chorizo, do you have anything to add? I know that you started, like, uh, you know, how you encourage your staff, growing your produce on site and, and consuming them on site. That must be very exciting for the staff as well. Yeah, I, I, um, I share a lot of the common experience that the two um, speakers have um, went through. And at, at Scal, I think um, other than those experiences, what we have really put in effort 
is to build our own e-culture. And um, we have got a five e-culture that starts with ethics, uh, where we all understand that it's our, it is our responsibility to take an active role to protect our planet and also our community. And then environment, where we all take an active role also in looking for ways to improve key areas such as energy or water or air quality initiatives. A uh, third one is exploration, where we will put in efforts to look for transformational technology to change the process, such as you know, spending 10 years looking for a waterless dying technology. And then comes excellence, which means that we cannot forego also the importance of quality or profit while we are working on these initiatives. And lastly is education, which I think is also very important yeah. because it's a constant um, effort to work on developing our members to be prepared and to learn new knowledge and to adopt new ways of working. So I think this e-culture has helped us to really build, uh, these have, be have become the DNA for every members. And uh, so it is a lot easier for us as a group um, to move forward on the very challenging sustainability journey. Yeah, thanks for sharing a very insightful journey. Thanks to three of you. So my last question, as we have three minutes left, um, I would like to touch upon, you know, very important questions I think three of you also address. Not only working uh, on improving your, you know, more efficient machines and operation and education about, you know, your own staff, also working with your customers and suppliers and also, you know, also may maybe partnering with other, your competitors as well, right? So, um, in terms of building collaborative ecosystem, um, we know that energy transition, we, we enable this low carbon transition. Um, nobody can do this alone, um, you know. So, um, so I, we have three minutes left. I, I maybe I would like uh, to steal your brain a little bit. What is the top two tips that you would give to other companies? Um, you know, building the ecosystem, trying to start the journey, where would you be recommending them if they want to start the, tackling the climate challenge, where should they start? So maybe the question goes to um, Teresa first, just to be fair. Okay, very quickly, I think um, my sharing on the two tips will be the first one is to really for, um, foster strategic partnerships. I think which we have mentioned, like it is important to get all the partners within the supply chain to be aligned. And uh, also it's um, your commitment because sometimes you may not find a supplier who is willing to do this, but then they can be very, very cheap. Um, then it's your, your commitment saying that, no, I still don't want to work with them. And um, so um, you have to look for a smarter way. And also, also to share very, um, you know, um, the second one will be internally, um, we have continuously conduct education to engage our members. So I think getting all the members within your own team to really be engaged and willing to embrace this uh, is also a very, very important part of making this ecosystem work. Great. So um, I would like to turn to Delman, if I may. Um, so what's your top two tips? If somebody needs to start this climate challenge journey, where would you recommend someone to start? So on this last subject, we only have 40 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> running out of time, sorry. Um, <laughs> We're running out of time when it comes to 2030 or so. Of course. Um, so I'm going to steal some time here. Um, I'm going to, I think it's going to be top one tip. <laughs> um, it's, it's a scary target, all the numbers that Andrew mentioned and others. It's a scary target. It's not like any other target that you may have set your organization where you know the solutions. 
So being scared of it, doing it and committing to it, it's, it's, it's normal. <laughs> so that's the first thing, first psychological barrier you need to get through. Um, the second, I get, well, it's, it's the same point, is that th there are a lot of us on this same boat that have made the commitment because the, the planet needs it in, in super quick time. Um, so there's a lot of help available. Any one of us and others in the room can actually help to share the experience with you. And so be prepared that it's a scary target. None of us have all the answers. Um, there are a lot of help available. Getting your own organization incentivized with some of the things we mentioned before is important. But the other difficult thing is you need to be prepared to go beyond your own organization. That's where the word collaborative effort, collective action comes into play. Not just down and up and down the supply chain with your customer, with your supplier, also possibly with fellow manufacturers, things that we learned. I learned a few things from Andrew over lunch, what he's doing as well. So sharing amongst manufacturers um, within Hong Kong, within the industry uh, as well. So SAC, Sustainable Apparel Coalition, of course, is one organization that helps to bring everyone together and, and share experiences on, on what to do. And I guess that's it. Um, if you're committed, there are a lot of help, but don't, it's, it's a little bit scary, but it's okay. Yeah. Thanks, Delman, for calming us down. So don't get too scared. Let me turn to Andrew. Um, so what are your top tips, um, you know, in tackling climate change for someone who start the journey? Uh, rather, other than in addition, not to be scared. Okay. Uh, I know I'm on negative time. So, but anyways, I, I think, you know, I agree with what Teresa and uh, what Delman has said 100%, you know. So I, I might just add a little bit uh, due to time. Uh, so I think it is very, I think I, was, I would say the most important part is really, you know, the, the whole supply chain collaboration. You know, how to work with your customers, you know, to see whether, how serious the customers are, and, and then push back to the customer. You know, because it's, uh, you know, uh, just us as apparel manufacturers cannot do things alone. You know, we need to work with our customers uh, to tell them what, what they need to do to help us. Uh, they might not do it, but at least, you know, we need to communicate what we need them to do, you know. Uh, and at the same time, same thing with, our, uh, with uh, the fabric mills and other suppliers. We need to communicate with them. So I think with these communications, I think, you know, not 100% of the things that we want to do can be done. But, you know, if, even if we can do one third, one, uh, 50%, that would help the whole process uh, tremendously. Uh, the second point I would like to add, uh, to, to say is important, is uh, to get a very strong alignment in, with your top team. Uh, and then also to form a, uh, a sustainability team. You know, which focuses to to do all the research, to do all the strategies. You know, so that you know, so that uh, uh, to it will give the business teams, you know, a, a much easier uh, time, you know, to implement you know sustainability projects. Okay. Thank you, Andrew, for all the great tips. Thanks, uh, Teresa, and thanks, Delman. Um, I would also like to thank. Three of my speakers, uh, very distinguished speaker with a lot of experience, who share, you know, how to go beyond target, not to be scared, uh, form the right sustainability team, integrate, um, you know, those sustainability goals in, into into your business goals, and don't be afraid to try. Um, there are other tips on, you know, talking to your customers and, and try to voice out your concern and, you know, you might not get heard, but one day, you, ne you know, you never know, right? So one day you might be able to get what you want. So thank you so much. Um, so from the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, uh, I also want to give you some tips. So we have a decarbonization guide, which is free to download from our website, apparelcoalition.org. So feel free to download the decarbonization guide if you want to start your journey. And I'm happy to help. And there are also Sustainable Apparel Coalition's uh, staff here who can also give you some tips on how do we go about in tackling climate change. So thank you so much for attending, and thank you three of my speakers um, for attending the you know, um, run wonderful sharing experience and insights. So thank you so much, and I appreciate all your time and effort. Thank you so much. Thank you.